When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. And it shall be, when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, and proclaim peace unto it, and it shall be, if, if it make thee answer of peace, and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the woman and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself, and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations, but of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, they, that they teach you not to do after their abominations, which they have done unto their gods, so should ye sin against the Lord your God. When thou shalt besiege a city a long time in making war against it to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat of them, and thou shalt not cut them down, for the tree of the field is man's life, to employ them in the siege. Only the trees which thou knowest that they be not trees for meat, thou shalt destroy and cut them down, and thou shalt build bulwarks against the city that maketh war with thee, until it be subdued. So here we have a portion of scripture dealing specifically with wars, and how Israel ought to fight these wars. Now he's describing two different types of groups that they would go up against, first being the nations that are far off from them, and secondly being the nations that are within the land that the Lord gives them as an inheritance. That land that they're to inherit, again, we remember, is a land that they're not going to fight hard for. They wouldn't necessarily even fight for it if they would just go by faith and allow God to remove them out of that promised land before they entered in. But here, nevertheless, he gives some examples about how to deal with these types of situations. Verse 1 Here's the setting that is described. It says, when thou goest out to battle. So we're talking about going out to battle. Are you going out to battle this day? This would be where they would turn. They would, they would decide that they were going to go to battle, and they'd be like, okay, what are we going to do? Deuteronomy 20 is going to give us the key of what to do in these situations. 
Are you going out to battle this day? When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Recently we had a memory verse that said, The Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And we're not to fear and we're not to be afraid and be confounded when we do find ourselves in battles. He says here, you're going out to battle against enemies. Not only that, though, they have horses. They have chariots, and they're described as being a people more than thou. In other words, they're outnumbered, they're out, they're out horsed, they're out charioted, if that's a word. They, they've got more against them than they have for themselves. But the command nevertheless remains, be not afraid. And how often in the Christian life are you standing against the odds? You're standing as one against many in the stands that we do make in the battles in our life and it seems like everything's against us and we're at a loss and we're going to lose this battle nevertheless god has the same command for us he says be not afraid of them no matter how many they have against you and how can that be the case we're outnumbered lord we 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 are weaker than them they are stronger than us they have more more battlements than us they have more horses more at their disposal how can we not be afraid? Well, the reason is, is because the Lord thy God is with thee. The Lord thy God is with thee. The Bible describes that God is able to save by many or few. There's, there's Numbers are no issue to the Lord God. We're going to find that out here because he takes what would be a great big, um, a, a great big army, which is still less than that of the enemies, and he starts to dwindle it down at the command of the officers here. So let's look at some practicals. They begin in verse 2. It says, And it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. So here's some practicals. This priest, the spiritual leader, he comes, and essentially what happens is he just expounds unto the people the biblical truth that is presented in verse 1. Be not afraid. Why? The Lord thy God is with thee. Watch verse 3, how that carries out. And he says, And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not, and do not tremble, neither be afraid because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And so the priest comes out and takes that little spiritual truth there of verse 1 and expounds it unto two different verses there unto the people to give them encouragement. He says, don't let or don't allow, don't permit, don't suffer your heart to faint, don't suffer your heart to fear, don't suffer it to tremble or be terrified. You ought not allow that emotion to enter in your heart at any time. Doubting, fearing, trembling, being terrified because of them. Certainly these attributes you can give to God. You can faint before Him, fear and tremble and be terrified before the Lord your God. He's the only one that deserves that right place in your heart. But because of them, you need not fear. If you're on the Lord's side, you need not fear what any man can do unto thee. The Bible is clear in that promise. Now keep your finger in Deuteronomy chapter 20. I'm going to go for a little bit of a segue over to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And if you do have a book... Mark, you can keep uh, one there in Psalm 27, because I'll be back there for the second sermon. But I just want to deal with a little bit of what God is saying. He says, hey, be not afraid because of them. And certainly there are going to be times when you'll be outnumbered, when you'll be seeming like you're losing in the battle of life here. But God still commands, be not afraid. Psalm 27 in verse 10, it says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. In other words, when you're forsaken, when you're all alone, when you've got nothing that is on your side, when you seemingly have no cause to fight this battle, when you're forsaken utterly, that's when God will take you up. He will lift you up and bury you in those times. You can look, um, I'll read for a moment, Psalm or Proverbs 24 and verse 10, it says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. We need to put our trust in our strength in something bigger than us. We need not faint because we've trusted in God who is bigger and greater than us and bigger and greater than any of our challenges. If you're finding yourself fainting when adversity comes your way, 
Look at what your strength is. Look at where you're putting your strength. Verse 20, or chapter 27 there, and in verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. We need to put our confidence not in our own self. Because if you're being confident in your own self, your own strength, your own wisdom, your own way, you are going to faint in the day of adversity. This confidence has to be in the light, has to be in your salvation, has to be in the strength of life. And that's the Lord God Almighty. He's all those things to the psalmist, and indeed he's all these things to you. Rhetorically, the question is asked, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid of when God is my light? Whom should I fear? Why should I doubt if he's my salvation, if he's my hope? Why should I lose faith when he's the strength of my life? He is that strong tower. My heart should not fear. In this will I be confident. And what? In the Lord Almighty, simply. Verse 14, it says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Be patient when God's working in your life, and trust that he is indeed working in your life. Because sometimes it takes you being backed up against the Red Sea. Sometimes it takes you being cornered. Sometimes it takes you on, to be on your last morsel, your last dollar, your last, your last bit of strength before God steps in and shows himself to be mighty towards you. And we need to count on that by faith and simply wait on the Lord God who will provide us His light, His salvation, and His strength in due time. Psalm 2 and verse 11, quickly. Psalm 2 and verse 11. The Bible says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Remember the Bible said, Faint not, fear not, tremble not, be terrified not because of them. But when you're serving God with fear and rejoicing before Him with trembling, there's a joy in your heart when you're serving Him. Tremble before God, but with joy, not with a great awe-inspiring fear that brings terror to you that is a hard and, and hurtful feeling. No, there should be joy when you come to His presence and, and shake and tremble before His might as He does great exploits. Serve Him with fear. Rejoice as you walk with Him in that trembling that he brings into you. You can go to Jeremiah 20, Jeremiah 20, if you will. And in verse 11, Jeremiah 20 and verse 11. Jeremiah cries out, he's in derision. He's feeling like he ought to um, give up at this point. And yet the word is in his heart as a burning fire shut up in his bones. And he gets weary with well bearing, forbearing and could not stay. In other words, he could not hold the word of God in. He talks about how he's in derision, that fear is on every side, that all of his familiars watched for his halting. Peradventure he will be enticed. Peradventure we can prevail against him. Peradventure we can take revenge on the prophet. They're all saying at this time, he's alone. He's, he's, he's at a loss for words. He's having trouble even saying what God told him to speak. Everybody waits for his halting and waits for him until he can be destroyed. But Jeremiah reflects on his position right now and the great fear and dread that has come upon him. And I think he commits to himself this same thing. I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to faint. I'm not going to tremble and be terrified because of them. Why? Look at verse 11. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. God is a terrible one and he's in your corner. And so the terror that you have from God is completely different than the terror that your enemies are going to fear when their confusion comes upon them, when they're greatly ashamed, when you prevail over them. Don't look to your persecutors and think that they stand a chance. God is with you. 
He is a mighty and terrible one. And here Jeremiah, though he doubted and though he seemed to get to that point where his back was against the wall and he was almost ready to quit, he reminded himself of who's on his side. And it's the Lord that is on, is on his side. We need to remember these things when we're going to battle in our lives that God is on our side. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Your persecutors will not prevail against you. Your, your, your sins, your besetting sins will not triumph over you. Your own flesh will not overcome you. Your enemies will not conquer you and defeat you and bring you to an end because the Lord God is on your side. Be not afraid of the things that you are battling. Why? The Lord God is with thee is the promise there in verse 1. We continue on in verse 5. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. So here the armed authority, the officer. We've heard from the priest, from the religious side. Now we're hearing from the leader of the soldiers, the officers here. And they come out, and they're not desiring to gather more people to the battle. It's completely opposite. They're trying to gather the right people to the battle and weed out the people that need not go and face this enemy. They speak, and here's five or three different exemptions from the battle that's before them. The first is that a man that hath built a new house, if he had not dedicated it, go, lest another man dedicate it. Next, there's someone that planted a vineyard in verse 6, and he hath not tasted of that, that, that sweet vine that he had planted and labored for. Lest you die in the battle, go and take for, and, and tend for that thing and, and, and eat and partake of it. Next is verse 7. It says, Is there a man that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her, hath not, hath not been with his wife? Let him go, lest another man take him, because he dies in the battle. And I know the Bible promises in 1 Samuel 14, 6 that there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or few. And this is why it's not God's desire here to make sure that everybody who can swing an axe and everybody who has some strength be involved in the battle. God very clearly has some grace for the people that you know, have just you know, had a new house made, have just had a new vineyard planted, have just taken a wife, and he says, there's no need for you to go to the battle. Stay back and enjoy those things while your brethren go and fight for you. Certainly there will be another opportunity for them to get into a fight while some of their other brethren stay back. And God here is just showing his, his he's being reasonable. Everybody doesn't need to get into the fight. Why? Because there's other duties for other people. You know, sometimes the ladies stay home from the battle so that the men can go out and get into the fight soul winning or whatever we want to talk about serving God in different ways there's sometimes that we divide and conquer in different things and somebody really gets involved in some activity in the church and other people sit back and rest we read in, uh, in Samuel there I'm dealing with David that those that went to the battle and those that stayed behind and had jobs that they took care of at home they reaped of the same reward. God is not in the business of saying, oh, you did more, so you get more. Now, everybody's going to equally partake of God's blessing when they're involved in the battle. And you can be involved in the battles that this church is involved in, even if you're not necessarily front line in the battles. You can pray. You can encourage. You can strengthen other people. There's so many ways to get involved. And here, God has some stay back and partake of some things that they would like to enjoy at this time. Ultimately, verse 8 gives you another group of people that should stay back. And it says, And the officers shall speak unto the people, and shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return into his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. God doesn't want fear in his fights. He doesn't want fear involved in his battles. The command at very first verse was, Be not afraid of them. And if anybody is afraid, the thing about fear is that it's contagious. If one of us is going to start having our knees knocking and getting worried and concerned, eventually all of us will be concerned in the same way about things that go on before us. Have you ever experienced that when you're out in a dark path and you're usually all pretty confident until one person hears like a branch crack? 
And then you're all like, whoa, what was that? And you all start to, you know, even people that don't hear it, they're like, did you hear that? I didn't hear what you're talking about. Yeah, there was this big thing out there. And now everybody's afraid. Now everybody's nervous about the big beast that could be hiding off in the woods. Just a silly example. But that's how fear works. It's contagious. It, it, it catches people's imaginations and it runs with them. We're to cast down every imagination, but we're also frail enough that sometimes our thoughts get the best of us, don't they? So God here simply allows provision for the ones that can fight and aren't afraid to be at their best. Sends them out there. No fear in their hearts. No, no, no worry for them and care for the things at home that they need to enjoy or need to take care of. He allows for everybody that's fearful and everybody that's got other responsibilities to return. The officers then take those that are strong, able, faithful, and, and focused to get them into the fight. And that's the ones that God would choose to go forward. He wants people that are involved in the battle to be fearless and faithful to the work that's ahead of them. Verse 9, And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. So now that we have everybody that's going to the battle, we align them up and put them in order and ranks. And we do that according to, according to how the officers would see fit. Now, verse 15, we'll see later, that gives us instructions for the neighboring companies. Or, or verse 15 gives us instructions for the country that they're entering into. In other words, the promised land, nations of people that dwell in the land that they are going to remove from the land as they march into it. Here we find instructions for a neighboring nation. Okay, so we continue on in verse 10. It says, When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. Okay, so Christians ought not go and just get into every fight we can. Proclaim peace unto it. So they've approached unto a city that's on their borders for whatever reason. It's a neighboring city. And the time has come to go out to battle. That's what verse 1 says. We're going to go out to battle. But they don't just charge in and then destroy right away. They seek peace. And the Bible records that Christians ought to, as much as in us is, live peaceably with all men. They're going to find if there's some sort of resolution that they can make. They proclaim peace unto this nation. Verse 11, it says, And it shall be if it make the answer of peace. And open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. So they will now be under tribute, they will now be under servitude, they will have pay and they will work, but they will nevertheless be allowed to live and continue on just as they had at the time when Israel arrived. A neighboring city, peace. They say, peace, okay, you can stay here on, on the edge of our, our nation. You'll pay tribute unto us. In other words, you pay tribute, we'll watch out for you. Because the promise of God is that Israel is going to be the biggest nation. They're going to be God's nation on earth. They're going to be the salt and light of the earth. They're going to go forward and from one end of heaven unto the other, show forth the righteous works of God, show how to serve God, show people the light that is God, and they were to be an influence in that way. By how they had righteous judgments, all the world was to look at them and go, what nation is there like unto them and want to essentially fall unto tribute? They come and say, peace, because of the wonderful testimony of God's people and how God is working in their lives, everybody ought to look at that example and be like, wow, I want to be part of this great nation. And so we see here that it was no, no harm for these people to say, yes, I will be under tribute. We will serve with thee. We will come under the wing of the Lord God of Israel and we will serve alongside you and pay you whatever finite tribute there would be. It's no big deal unto them. But if there's no peace, we'll continue on in verse 12. It says, And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then shalt thou besiege it. Now, a besieging is when you surround, when you starve, and eventually smite a nation. So a besiegement, again, isn't an active form of war in the sense that they just bust the gates open, come in, and just start destroying everybody that's there right off the bat. A, a battlement or a besiegement 
is such that they will actually, verse 13 it says, And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it to thy hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. So the besiegement essentially was, they lock in all the ways in and all the ways out, and eventually they just lose out on their, their, their stock. They can't go and they can't collect water. They, can't, they, they just starve out. And that's how, essentially, they wait, the people of God, for the people that they are at battle against to simply just give up for lack of resources. And so they're waiting on the Lord at this time. They're simply mounting up against them in a battlement and besieging them and waiting for the end to come. This was how God prescribed that the people of Israel go to battle. And it says, and when the Lord hath delivered it into thine hands. So it's not something that they conjured up of their own strength. Rather, they just simply stood and waited and God took care of the rest. Great, great illustration for how we fight our battles. We don't go out and get into every fight. We wait and we let God do the work. We simply stand and set up the battlement. Verse 13, And when the Lord thy God hath delivered into thine hands, thou shalt smite every man with the edge of the sword. Of course, now the enemy is weakened and ready to be taken out. Verse 14, But the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof shalt thou take unto thyself, and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Verse 15, Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from the city, which are not of the cities of this nation. And so this was a way that, that God could essentially allow for his people, if there was any neighboring nations that proved themselves to be hostile and not willing, not willing to follow the Lord God and come under tribute in that way, then God could give the, the battle to his people and they could actually grow in influence and in strength as a result of God giving them these cities that are very far off, but not necessarily nigh, and definitely not the nations that are in the place which he promised, the promised land. Now regarding this nation, look at verse 16, it says, But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God shalt give thee, or doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that hath breath. So we notice that the women and the little ones and the cattle and all of these different forms of spoil were kept with the other nations and the other cities, but specifically the ones that are within the inheritance, nothing that had breath was to remain. But they were to destroy all forms of life within the nations that the Lord thy God doth give thee. He says that over and over and over. The land that I give thee, you shall remove from thence all the nations there, saving none of them alive. Now, why would that be the case? He refers to them by name here. Utterly destroy them, verse 17. Namely, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God doth command thee. They were to be removed. They were to be expelled from the land. Nothing that had breath was to remain, but they were to be utterly destroyed. Why would that be the case? Look at verse 18. There was a risk here. There was, there was a, a potential for infection to enter into them. And it's not a virus, but it's the infection of sin. Verse 18, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations, which they have done unto their gods so should ye sin against the Lord your God. And this is obviously and always going to be the biggest plague on mankind. It's sin and our tendency to sin. We are susceptible to catching that disease more than any. Why? Because it's in us already. And we're already desiring that. We're already attracted to that. Our own lusts draw us and entice us unto sin. We don't need anybody's help or influence. But it's so much worse when there's a neighbor when there's a nation among you, when there's people among you, co-workers, friends, family members, that coerce you to do the abominations that they do, that's even more risky because we're easily susceptible to influences such as that. Now regarding this nation in particular, keep your finger there in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. And in Leviticus chapter 20, we're going to learn, and we have read this before, certainly, but about these nations. They're not just any nation. They're not just a nation that they happened upon, that happened to be in a land very far off from them, which 
came into uh, contention with Israel, and, and eventually they decided to go to war against Israel, and God had it that he would destroy them. No, these nations, have already, it's already been decided that they would be destroyed. Even before God showed them the promised land, he promised that the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and all those such nations would be destroyed because God said that it ought be so. And what was the reasoning for that? Verse 22 of Leviticus 20, verse 22 Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. Ye shall not walk in the manner of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. God's desire is that he would put difference between the nations that they're entering into their land and them as they walk in to inherit that land. Why? Because they committed all of these abominations. Verse Verse 23 is so telling because if you read through Leviticus, the abominable customs and the abominable things, murder, uh, you know, destroying and, and murdering innocent children, incest, and all sorts of sexual gratification that they took upon themselves as just normal. It was normal for these people to their gods to perform these abominations. And so God had it because of their wickedness, that they would be removed. And God decided a long time ago. He's simply now using his people Israel to enter in and dispossess them. We continue on in Leviticus 26. It says, And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. That was God's intent, Deuteronomy 20, was that his people would be his. They would be distinctly his. It would be evident that they were his. And one of the main tells is that as God is holy, his people ought to be holy. And today, Christians, as God is holy, ye ought to be holy. Don't get involved in the abominable customs of your co-workers. Don't get involved in the abominable customs of your family members. Don't get involved in the abominable customs of your neighbors and your friends. All of that draws an influence in your life that will make you susceptible and more susceptible to the sin that is already in you. You don't need any help falling into sin. You don't need anybody to, to course you into that. You can't say the devil made you do it. You're plenty good at falling into sin on your own. I'm plenty good at falling into sin on my own, so what I need to do is set up safeguards. For here, the people of Israel, their safeguard was to go in and dispossess everyone that would hinder them from serving God in righteousness and in truth. And we ought to be mindful of that. If we have family members that are just constantly and consistently alluring us to sin and motivating us to sin and actively encouraging us after sin, maybe we need to dispossess them from our lives. Maybe we need to have God remove them from our promised land of Christian liberty. The promised land resembles Christian liberty that gives us righteous living. Essentially, righteous Christian living is the type of promised land that we see. You don't want your promised land to be removed from you. You don't want to be kicked out of the nation and have your, your righteous life, your walk with Christ, to be removed and to be destroyed and to, and to have you vomited out of it simply because you let bad influences in your, in your life take control of you. When you go to battle, follow the examples that they do. Go to battle and utterly dispossess these lands with the same vehement attention as save nothing of it alive. We ought to be like that with regards to our old life. Right? Don't, don't, don't give place for old habits to catch up with you. Don't even dwell in the same places where you used to do such things. Don't even hang around with the old people that used to, um, used to haunt these places with and, and, and do these things with. These abominable customs need to be removed from your life. And I think that's an example that we can take from these scriptures. We'll continue on in verse 19. It says, When thou shalt besiege a city a long time, in making war against it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat them, 
and thou and and thou shalt not cut them down for the tree of the field is man's life to employ them in the siege only the trees which thou knowest that they be not trees for meat thou shalt destroy and cut them down and thou shalt build bulwarks against the city and make that maketh war with thee until it be subdued. So again, we see another promise that that city will be subdued, and God just gives His people Israel some some advice for how to deal with that. If there's a tree that's going to give you meat and sustenance, let it alive. You might be here in siege around this city for a long time. Any other trees, hew them down, use them as bulwarks, use them as battlements, use them as as protection, build houses with it. But while you're in the siege, you're going to need some provision. You're going to need some food and some sustenance. And it could be that God planted that tree in that field at that time, you know, 20 years ago, so that it could plant food specifically for his people at that time. But God just gives practical advice here. He says, hey, when you're in battle, you're going to need sustenance. So therefore, don't destroy all the sustenance around you. Let those trees live and use them for their intended purpose to provide for you meat at this time. The tree of the field is man's life. One day there will be a tree of life in heaven and that will have all manners of fruits that we will eat and enjoy. But here he's just given you a basic example of a tree that you'll need when you're going to battle against the nations that are around you. Thank you, Father.